So our final example. So this will be solved the exact same way we just did last one. So we got y double prime plus four y prime plus four y. That one seems very familiar. But on the right side, we have something different. 3x e negative 2x. All right, I think we saw the left side already. So I'm just going to write the yc solution down. I think we got 2 for our m. So it was, we're using, I think we're using b's or c's. We're using, we're using b's before. So we got b1 e2x. I think it'd be negative two plus b two x e negative two x. So we got m equals negative two uh, order two. So if you remember this one, we got uh, m plus two m plus two. That was our factoring. I think that was even on this page. Oh yeah, right here. So it was the exact same homogeneous as this one. So I'm not going to go through all those steps to get the m values. All right, so that's our yc. Now we're going to take derivatives of q of x. So let's go ahead and do that. So our qx was 3x e negative 2x. All right, q prime of x. I have a product rule here. So it's going to be 3 e negative 2x plus, <clears throat> it's actually a minus six, minus six x e negative two x. Is that, does that look the product rule correctly applied? All right, take the next derivative right now, find q double prime. You're still gonna have a product rule going on. Okay, so any questions on that second derivative right there? If I took a third derivative, would I get any new linearly independent terms? Or would I get terms that are just multiples of terms I already have? Multiples of terms. So I'm just going to get repeated terms. The constants will be different, but they'll be overall linearly dependent. So I could have stopped at the second derivative it looks like. I didn't get anything new, or I, I could have stopped the first derivative, but I went to the second just to be sure. I mean, you're going to keep getting new numbers. Yeah, but I'll keep but getting just constant e to the negative 2x and x e to the negative 2x. So yeah. There's really only two terms that come out of all these derivatives. So I'll circle them just like before. So we had our x e to the negative 2x and then constant e negative 2x. So those are our only two independent terms. <clears throat> now we have to go back. If you notice, those are the exact same terms we already had right here. Those are the exact same terms we already had. So let's go back and read what we're supposed to do on the instructions. So we're reading uh, case one, no term in QX is the same as a term in YC. Well, in fact, both terms in QX are the same. But as long as just one is, I'm in case two. So what do we do in case two when we have a uh, linear dependency? I multiply the dependent terms, I'm reading right here, multiply dependent terms by x to the n, where n is the smallest power to give us independence. 
So let's go ahead and do this. <clears throat> and you really want a summary of case one and case two on your cheat sheet, or do enough problems so that you just know what to do. So we're going to get terms x e negative 2x and just e negative 2x. All right. <clears throat> So we're supposed to multiply these terms by x to a power until I get linear independence. So we'll start with uh, that term uh, x e negative 2x. What is the smallest power of x I can multiply so I have independence from my original homogeneous solution? Two. So I th yeah, I can write it as x, basically multiply it by x to the first power. So we got x squared e negative 2x. So that gives us independence right there. So I basically had to bump the power up 1 on x. So this is our new linearly independent term. <clears throat> so any questions on that idea? We're just multiplying by a power of x to make give us independence. All right. <clears throat> Second term. What do I have to? How many? What order of x do I need to multiply this by? Two. So we can try two. But that gives us dependence on the previous term. So we're actually going to go one more higher. So they all need to be independent, not just de independent of the for, of the original homogeneous solution. So, so we actually you're allowed to multiply your new terms by different powers of x or not? The minimum power to give independence. But like so, on your we have like x e to the negative two x e to the negative two x. Are you allowed to multiply each of those by a different power? Yeah, of x? it's the minimum power to make them independent. Okay. I could have started with uh, this this term, in which case I would have gone straight to x squared. And then the second term, I would have only needed an x squared on that one. But the net effect is I will have two, no matter what order I go, those are the two terms I'm going to get, no matter which of those routes I would go. So those are our independent terms now. So this is the particular solution to the non-homogeneous. So I already used b1, b2. We can go b3, b3x squared e negative 2x plus b4x cubed e negative 2x. So that's our particular solution. Remember this b3, b4, you can find these constants. All you do is take derivatives, plug it back in, you'll get your constants out of there. We find B3 and B4 by plugging back in. And then your overall solution is homogeneous plus particular. So once you get B3, B4, you can write out your full solution. What would I need to figure out B1 and B2? Two initial conditions. So I need two initial conditions. So the original, the homogeneous constants, you can't figure out without actually some more information. And just remember, we had order two differential equations, so I should have two undetermined constants. Those are B1 and B2, not B3 and B4. So we are done with constant coefficient linear ODEs, both homogeneous and non-homogeneous. So ready to go into the next section. Oh, actually we're not, <coughs> we're going to the next section, but we're still going to be operating on 
uh, linear ODEs. We're actually going to only look at order 2 to begin with, but we're going to look at what happens if Q of X has infinite linearly independent derivatives. So obviously polynomials have a finite number of derivatives. Sine and cosine, you can keep taking derivatives, you're going to get the cosine and sine. But even something easy like tangent, what's the derivative of tangent? Secant squared. Secant squared. It's secant squared. It's a little more tricky, but it's going to be some secants and some tangents mixed together, multiplied and whatnot. Then you take the next derivative, you're going to have even more stuff, and things get more and more complicated, so you'll end up with this kind of increasing mess of secants and tangents multiplied out, which unfortunately will probably all be independent. So there are some functions that get significantly worse. Even something easy like 1 over x, the derivative of that is x to the negative 2 times a constant. The derivative of that is x to the negative 3 times a constant, x to the negative 4 times a constant. So something that looks easy like this actually right away has infinite derivatives. So you can't do the method I just showed you, which is write an infinite sum of these uh, together. So we're about to look at what happens when derivatives of q are infinite. Does that also work for something like q of x is e to the x squared? I believe it does, yeah. So there's a lot of examples of functions who have an infinite number of independent derivatives if you keep going. There's a whole lot of functions that do that. That 1 over x is the easiest one I could think of. That's like, oh, obviously, you just get increasing negative powers of x. So we're going to jump into variation of parameters. So we're going to consider second order linear non-homogeneous ODEs with infinite linearly independent derivatives of Q of X. only second order so we can write it out pretty easily. Uh, we're assuming a2 is not 0. If a2 is 0, this would be a first order uh, ODE, not a second order. So step one, uh, let's label this as asterisk because I'm going to refer back to it a couple times. So first you're going to find yc, which is the homogeneous solution. So I know that yc is going to be norm. So from before, we had yc was basically, uh, I'll do the, use the b's, b1. And then it was a function of x. I mean, very specific, it was a very specific function of x, but it was e to the mx. And then the other one was e to some other mx. Uh, but I'm just going to write them as just some function of x. Usually they were e to the mx or x e to the mx. That was generally what they were. <coughs> so what we're going to do now is generalize this a little bit. So we're going to basically take out the b1 and b2 and replace them by functions of x. So that's what we're going to do. So instead of assuming that they're actually just constants, we're going to replace them by functions of x. Uh, 
out. Your book uses U1 of X and U2 of X. So we're going to assume that YC is now U1 of X times Y1 of X plus U2 of X, Y2 of X. How did we figure out the coefficients of y1 and y2 before? We basically plugged it back in. So that's all we're going to do now. The only serious problem is our derivative is not going to be very fun because we're going to have some serious product rule going on. So we're going to compute yc prime and yc double prime. And they're going to get way uglier before they get nicer. So before we do that, let's we know everything's a function of x, so I'm just going to write it as u1 y1 plus u2 y2. So we just know they're functions of x, so I'm not going to keep writing of x of x of x every single time. It's going to take forever. So I need to, we only need the second derivative, this is only a uh, second order. So we have product rule, so we got u1 prime y1 plus u1 y1 prime plus u2 prime y2 plus u2 y2 prime. So that was just a relatively easy product rule on each of those terms. All right, find the second derivative now. You got four product rules to deal with, so there should be eight terms total here. So find the second derivative right now. And if you have any similar terms, group them up. There should be a couple terms that are repeat, so you should get two of a couple of the terms you see. I think we only have two repeats. It's basically the, the each term has a first derivative. Those should be repeated. So all we're going to do next is take this mess and plug it into the original ODE. So I'll write the ODE out. I think it's going to take probably two lines unless I do some ridic ridiculous zoom out or something like that or you put two pieces of paper next to each other. So I'm just going to write <coughs> our ODE out on separate lines. So write it down originally. A2 <coughs> Y double prime plus A1 Y prime plus a0 y equals q of x. So when I write this vertically, let's do our first line. y double prime is obviously the messiest. So I'm going to write it vertically like this. So I'll do my second derivative on one row, my first and no derivative on the next row, and then q of x down below. Should we distribute our like, a2 throughout it or just like a2? Yeah, yeah we're going to have to do that too. So 
So I'll, I'll do the A2. Yeah, we're going to fully distribute the A's across and then regroup. We're basically going to regroup by, uh, by U's, basically. So I'm having trouble keeping everything on the screen and legible at the same time. I think the zoom level lets me do most of that. So I just wrote out A2 Y double prime. So I basically distribute A2 across the Y double prime C up there. Now I'm going A1 distributing across Y prime, which is now at the top of the board. And when you start writing, um the four, that's not a four, that's just um, four derivatives, the four derivatives that we mean by that, right? Uh, I got u's and y's, I got no fours, the only number I got is uh, ones and twos. Uh -huh. And okay, the ones in the subscript are ones, the ones in the exponent are primes. Oh, so the other oh, two blocks for a second now. You sit here if you want. With my glasses, I can see without my glasses. You should wear your glasses. <laughs> There's, there's no exponents. Every exponent looking thing is, they're all derivatives. A1, U2 prime, Y2, A1, U2, Y2 prime. All right, so that's my first derivative times A1, and now my A0 times my just original YC, which is now at the top of the board plus a0 u1 y1 it really makes me wish the product rule was just u prime v prime not u prime v plus u v prime that would have made this problem a lot easier if the product rule was different all right so we got a0 u2 y2 yeah, it looks crazy. All right, so I think that's correct. I'm going to try to just keep the kind of left side of the equation up here. So now what I'm going to do is group up by... I'm going to get all the U1s. Every term with a U1 and a U2, I want to get all the U1 terms together. So I'll just start circling all, not the U1 derivatives, but just U1. I should use a highlighter. should be three. Okay. The point is to eventually make a set of equations that we can solve for the U1 and U2 functions. Yeah, so U1 and U2, yeah, so we should talk about what we're trying to do. 
we know how to get y1 and y2, so we're really trying to find u1 and u2. So we're rearranging everything so that we can basically solve as best we can for u1 and for u2. So we'll get uh, some information on u1 and some information on u1 prime and information on u1 double prime, basically. So that's kind of how, that's our goal for regrouping. So I get u1 times a2 y1 double prime plus a1 y1 prime plus a0 y1. So that takes care of our u terms. Now, or our u1 terms. Now we're going to do the same thing for u2. So I'll go with another color highlighter. We'll go for all the u2 terms. Three terms, I'm using green for these. So I have A2, Y2 double prime plus A1, Y2 prime plus A0, Y2. So that takes care of our U2, U1 terms. And <coughs> the way we're going to regroup everything else is by it's the best way to describe it. Let's regroup by a one and a two. I think we took out all our A0 terms. So those terms are all done, or all accounted for. So I'm going to group up by the constants now. So everything left over I didn't circle. I'm going to go with the A2 terms first. So I have plus A2 times, and I'll go in with a new color. I'll circle all my A2 terms. Let's go orange, A2. A2, A2, A2. All right, so we got four of those. One terms are easy, it's just u1 prime y1 plus u2 prime y2. And all this stuff still equals q of x. Alright, so that's a whole lot of algebra. Now we're going to do some funky calculus. group the A2 term a little bit.
In my notes, I have the first two terms supposed to equal zero, but I don't see immediately why. Oh, I know why that's the case. So I don't want to keep writing these top two terms. They're both going to equal zero. Let's use a color I haven't used. Let's go purple. All right. Why is what I just put a box around equal to zero? If you want to keep the term. What's that? Maybe you want to keep the term. So we'll nope. The whole thing. It's a little more tricky than that. What what was y1 originally? <coughs> way, way, way up here. I probably didn't write it down. I think I said it, but didn't write it down. So what was y1 originally? I wrote it here, but what, how would you describe y1 and y2? What type of solutions are they? Homogeneous. So they're a homogeneous solution. So what does that mean? It means if I plug it in, I don't get Q of X, I get zero. So homogeneous solutions are the solutions to the ODE equaling zero, not Q of X. So Y1 is homogeneous solution. So that means if I plug it into the original, I won't get Q of X, I'll get the original equals zero. That's what it means to be a homogeneous solution. So that means a two y one prime uh, double prime plus a one y one prime plus a zero y one equals zero. That's what it means to be a homogeneous solution. It means if I plug it in, I get zero. So any questions on that idea? Uh, just what that means. Same thing is true for y2. So y1 and y2 are homogeneous solutions. So a2 y2 double prime plus a1 y2 prime plus a0 y2 also equals zero. So those two facts, or those two equations, are the reasons that what I circled equals zero. So that's a little bit tricky. Same thing, our y2 is a homogeneous solution, also that equals zero. That entire, those two terms are both going to disappear. I don't want to keep writing if I don't have to. So it was a great time to say why they're equal to zero, so they're going to not be written anymore. All right, so they're equal to zero. I'm just going to write because they're homogeneous solutions. Can you see that any earlier? Uh, no, I had to group them up first to get them in that, like a two y one double prime plus a one y one prime plus a zero y one. That is the original ODE form. So it was scattered up here. I think that was the I think it was the blue or the green. But you know when you add all three blue terms together, you do get zero, but I would say it's not at all obvious until I group up like this. So theoretically, you could say, oh, yeah, cancel, cancel, cancel to zero. But that's a pretty ambitious canceling, if you can really see that happening. Yeah. So that's why I grouped them up and then very carefully said that's the homogeneous. Maybe if you've done differential equations for like seven years, you might be able to, oh, obviously, add those three together and get zero. Um, kind of like when you've been doing trig for a while, you can see like co-squared plus sine squared just cancels out to one after a, a long time of doing it, but it usually takes a little while before you see that happen. All right, so those two are gone. And now we're left with just these, uh, the second row here equals Q of X. So I'm going to regroup this a little bit, and I'm just going to copy out of my notes, and then we'll make sure that it's actually true. And I'm going to leave some extra space, actually. So there's an intermediate step that won't be obvious, but we'll go and kind of recover it. So 
there's a weird factoring happening here. It's not really a factoring, it's a derivative. So I'm gonna kind of circle every term that uh, we can clearly see where it went, where it came from. And so I see a2 u1 prime y1 prime y1 prime. So it was one of those terms went here. Uh, u2 prime y2 prime y2 prime. One of these terms went here. You know, let's go the other direction. Because that way we're going to have to go an antiderivative. All right. <coughs> I did something weird on this middle term right here. There's a derivative outside. So let's go ahead and compute this derivative here. It's easier to compute than it is to see. It's easier to go this direction than the other one. So we got a2 times product rule u1 double prime y1 plus u1 prime y1 prime plus u2 double prime y2 plus u2 prime y2 prime. And now I'll just copy the other terms. Okay, so there's originally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm counting these two, these double terms as two. So there's eight terms total right there. And I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight terms total on my second line. I'm just counting these two. There's really two terms hiding in these two times right there. So it should be all the same terms, just maybe a little reordering going on. So we'll just double check u1 y1 prime I'll use a blue marker to connect things together u1 y1 prime there's one of those u1 y1 primes u2 y2 prime there's one of those guys uh, u1 double prime y1 y1 right there and then this is a second one of that u1 prime y1 prime and u2 double prime y2 comes from that term and our last one is another copy of that term and then the other one just kind of copies straight over like that okay not easy to see all this happening but this is where everything's coming from right here oh perfect okay So why in the world are we doing this? So what are we looking at here? So we're going to choose u1 and u2 to make our last term equal to 0. basically solving the equation of 0 equals u1 prime y1 plus u2 prime y2. So we're picking u1 and u2 such that their derivatives satisfy this relationship right here. Now you should have wondered why in the world did I rewrite this weird product or the, this weird kind of product rule right here. What do you notice about u1 prime y1 plus u2 prime y2? What I underline basically appears twice. So that's the exact same thing right there. 
So we already know if we if we successfully pick u1 and u2 such that this is true. What do I get if I take the derivative of this equation? What's the derivative of zero? Zero. zero. And the right side, I'm just going to write as u1 prime y1 plus u2 prime y2, whole thing primed. Oh, look at that. This tells me if the original equation was equal to zero, the derivative of that equation will also still be zero. So by zeroing out my first term, I also zero out my second term. So once you pick u1 and u2 that make the first, uh, that, that term that I pointed to zero, you will also zero out the second term right here. So the second term also gets zeroed by your choice on your first term. And <coughs> what are we left with? We're left with the first term plus zero plus zero equals Q. So we're left with A2, U1 prime, Y1 prime, plus U2 prime, Y2 prime, equal uh, plus zero plus zero. I don't really want to write, but I will. All right, so we're left with this, basically first term equals Q. So we have a, well first of all, how many unknown functions do we actually have? We should be able to compute Y1 and Y2. That was the homogeneous solution that we did spend a couple days on. How many functions are we actually trying to figure out? Two. So we got basically two unknowns. It would be great if we had two equations. Oh, we have two equations. Well, there's more than two on the board, but the two that we're going to use are that equation and that equation. So we've got two system, system of two equations, two unknowns, perfect. So let's write it out. We got a uh, system, not a linear one, system of two equations and two unknowns, which will be u1 and u2. So I'll write the system out. Let's uh, divide by A2. So it'll be QX over A2. That'll be our, I'll, ri I'll write the zero equation first. So that's U1 prime Y1 plus U2 prime Y2 equals zero. And the second equation is on the left, U1 prime Y1 prime plus u2 prime y2 prime equals now this will be q of x I'm going to divide that a2 over to the right side alright so here's our system two equations two unknowns and way way up above we assumed a2 was not zero that's pretty important if we're going to be divided by it Those are U's. The so why the purple or unknowns before the two in in two unknowns two equations two variables that's all I'm writing doesn't necessarily mean it's an easy system but should be solvable is the point. Okay, so what I showed you was for degree two. So what we're going to do now is look what happens in nth degree. So we just did the easy case. So now we're going to do the hard case. Well, we're not going to do anything right now. <laughs> it's our case tomorrow. <laughs> so we're going to use the Ronskian and Kramer's rule. 
if you remember way back to linear algebra, you got n, n equations, n unknowns, you can use, if there's one solution, you can use Kramer's rule, as long as your uh, determinant's not zero. So that's the general method we're going to use to solve uh, the system we're going to get.